Uh, I have reached a new stage in parenting um, in the last like two months, which I'm pretty proud of. Um, and I've reached a stage where Owen will sit down and watch a movie or a TV show um, on his own. He's almost two. His birthday is coming up here. Um, and uh, in the past, he was completely disinterested in it. And we'd try to sit him down and he'd watch for like, I love Disney movies and John Lemon makes fun of me all the time for it. Um, but I'd sit down and I'd have these great aspirations to watch and enjoy Aladdin with him and he'd be interested for a little bit. And then he wouldn't anymore. But now we've reached that beautiful age with the giant high definition babysitter, um, and just not all the time, right? Don't judge me, okay? It's like the times when I need to go, like yesterday or a couple days ago, I had to go finish a sermon I was going to preach somewhere, and I just needed like 45 minutes, and so I, I turn on Amazon Prime, um, and I'm looking through it, and I see VeggieTales, um, and I see Lord of the Beans, and being an active LOTR fan, um, which shows you how nerdy I am because I use the acronym, uh, the LOTR fan, I put, on, put it on, that's Lord of the Rings, for you who don't understand, for you Harry Potter people, it's Lord of the Rings. Um, and I put on Lord of the Beans by VeggieTales, um, and, and I was kind of overhearing what was going on uh, from my office, and, and I heard the cucumber, who in this film was playing Gandalf, or some weird veggie version of Gandalf, um, he had, they, act, they wanted him to do something magical, and he failed to do it, and so the cucumber said, sorry, I'm really better at fireworks. Um, and that's because... If you read the books or if you watch the movies, the first introduction we have to Gandalf is his fireworks. And he comes into um, the Shire and he's got the fireworks and the hobbits love Gandalf's fireworks. Um, I'm talking about hobbits, okay? Hobbits and fireworks. Get over it. Um, and that's, that's all they care about. And their kids following his cart in there and they see him unloading these fireworks that have his insignia on it. But I think it's really interesting um, to see how Tolkien introduces Gandalf. Because on one hand, we have the response of the hobbits, but on the other hand, we have the response of the one who is writing the narrative of the story. And listen to how Gandalf is introduced. That was Gandalf's mark, of course. And the old man was Gandalf the wizard whose fame in the Shire was due mainly to his skills with fires, smokes, and lights. His real business was far more difficult and dangerous, but the Shire folk knew nothing about it. To him, he was just one of the attractions at the party. So here's the thing about hobbits, is they would have been completely content with Gandalf the Firework Master. They would have stayed in the Shire. They would have watched the fireworks. They would have been amused. They would have been amazed. They would have ooed and awed. But they didn't need Gandalf the Firework Master. What they needed was Gandalf the Wizard. What they needed was a wizard who was going to come and lead a quest that would ultimately save the Shire. But they were completely unaware of it. You see, the Shire would get by without Gandalf's fireworks. But it wouldn't get by without Gandalf putting all his power towards something else. And I open with this illustration because the passage we see in John today is really similar to that idea of the hobbits being excited about Gandalf, but being unaware of what it was they truly needed. And we're going to see Jesus performing many great works, and we're going to see crowds clamoring and pressing to get to him. But in the middle of it, we're going to see glimpses of Jesus' true power, but specifically his true purpose in why he came. And what I want to look at tonight, I want to look at three reasons why Jesus came. And I want those three reasons to help frame our view of how we view Jesus. But more importantly, I want it to frame how we approach and worship Jesus. The purpose of Jesus should shape our worship of him. And so we want to look intently at that. But let's, um, let's pray first. Lord, we, uh, we come before you and we are grateful in the loving way that Sean put it that this isn't irreverent babble, but this is the holy word of God that we want to submit ourselves to. And as we gather here on the University of Montana, Montana campus um, to look at the book of Mark in a series called Who is Jesus, Lord? That is our prayer tonight, that you reveal to us the reality of who Jesus is and why he came. Lord, we want to know him, we want to see him, we want to worship him, we want to be amazed by him, but more importantly, Lord, we want to be saved by Jesus. So we ask you to do that in our midst tonight. We love you, Lord. We pray this in your name. Amen. So, uh, if you have your Bibles open, we're going to be picking things up um, in verse 29 of Mark 1. And what we're going to see is we're going to see three stories, three separate stories that Mark is telling. Um, and, and in those stories, we're going to encounter three purposes. 
We see our first story um, in verses 29 through 33. And immediately he left the synagogue and entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law lay ill with fever, and immediately they told him about her. And he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sundown they brought to him all who were sick or oppressed by demons, and the whole city was gathered together at the door. And he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons, and he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. Now, before I introduce this first purpose, I want to point out I'm addressing these chronologically. So I'm addressing these stories and these purposes as John is laying them out, but I'm not addressing them in order of importance. In fact, John is going to let Jesus give us the order of importance for these purposes. And so we want to not assume that because this, this healing, this miracle is first, it shapes Jesus' purpose, but we want to wait until Jesus tells us why he came. So the first purpose, which we just saw, is that Jesus came to heal. And I love the progression of this text. And, and in Mark, um, uh, he's using the term Simon. That's, that's Simon Peter. That's Peter uh, the Apostle. And if you have your Bibles open, you see um, in Mark 1, 14 through 15, Jesus began his ministry. And then immediately after that, Jesus goes and he calls four disciples, one of whom is Peter. And then immediately after that, there's this progression. Immediately after that, Jesus goes with his new disciples into a synagogue where people are amazed at his teaching, and then demon, then demon Jesus, casts out a demon out of a man. And then immediately, and you see that the very first words we saw, immediately he left the synagogue. So there is no gap between Jesus casting out the demon to this story picking up. We see immediately Look in your Bibles, verse 29 through 30. Immediately he left the synagogue and entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother lay ill with fever, and immediately they told him about her. You see what happened here? Because there's a lot of dialogue that's missing. We're just seeing action here. Peter is called, Peter witnesses a miracle, and then Peter brings Jesus to his sick mother-in-law. Why? Because Peter is finally beginning to understand who Jesus is. He's beginning to see the uniqueness of Jesus. Peter recognizes that he has a power and an authority that has never before been seen. And so immediately, not after dialogue, not after pondering the cost, not after counsel or deliberation, immediately... They take Jesus to Peter's mother-in-law because he knew that Jesus is able to heal. They haven't witnessed any healings yet, but what Peter had, had seen affirmed him that Jesus does God-like things. This man does God-like things. And Peter, the disciples, and the mother-in-law just witnessed a God-like thing. Because my wife and I both this past year we each had a couple instances of really bad fever, just a really bad sickness. And you get the shakes and the chills and the aches, and you just feel like you got hit by a semi-truck and you're laying on a couch and you don't want to do anything. Um, and, and there was a point where we went and got antibiotics, and then the fever went away, and, and we got better. But you know what didn't happen? It's not that I took antibiotics, my fever went away, and then the one thing I didn't do, I didn't just jump up and start making dinner for people. Right, Sarah didn't jump up and go for a jog when her fever left her. Why? Because for days, we had done nothing but lay on a couch like a college student. That was our life. We had done nothing. We didn't eat. We didn't drink. We didn't get the, the, the vitamins or the nutrients we had. Our body was weak. And so even though the fever left us, there was a time of still lounging around on the couch, and you hope you're sick during football season, um, of, of that rehabilitation process. But did you see what happened in this story? Look at verse 31. And he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and the fever left her, and she began to serve them. You see, Jesus' healing is not like our healing. Jesus' healing completely restored this woman in a way no human medicine can. Immediately upon the healing hand of Jesus, this woman began to serve and act and do all that she was doing prior to being sick. And somehow, the news got out about this. 
Because we see a they in this next text, and we don't know if they is the disciples or if they are the town people, but what happens is they bring people to Jesus. Look at the following passage, Mark 1, 32 through 34. That evening at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick or oppressed by demons, and the whole city was gathered together at the door, and he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons, and he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. So for a whole day, we see from sunup to sundown, Jesus healed people. People came in floods. They were gathered at the door with this urgency to be healed, right? If, if you're sick and you find there's a man healing, you don't just go wait in line, right? You've seen Good or Black Friday, okay? That's to get toys. This is to get healing. And people are crowded at the door of Jesus' house with a passionate desire to be healed. And for a whole day, Jesus patiently and graciously healed them. He healed their physical sicknesses, and he healed their spiritual sicknesses as he cast out demons. Now, we saw a command that Jesus gave that's kind of unique, and he told the demons, he said, don't talk about me. And we're going to come back to that. Why would Jesus say that? But what Mark wants you to know here in this first paragraph is that Jesus heals. Jesus heals. And importantly, Jesus is gaining popularity. And then here's our next story. That was purpose one. Here's story two. And rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place. And there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him, and they found him and said to him, Everyone is looking for you. And he, that's Jesus, said to them, Let us go on to the next towns, that I may preach there also, for this is why I came out. And he went throughout all Galilee, preaching in the synagogues and casting out demons. Now we have just read what will prove to be a key to Mark's gospel here, because Mark wants us to know who Jesus is, but in order for Mark to let us know that, he also wants us to know why Jesus came. And Mark is reporting an event in Jesus' life which clarifies his purpose here on earth. And we see that purpose. Purpose number two, Jesus came to preach. Jesus came to preach. And I want to spend time on this because, like I said, this is a huge and important aspect of the text. And it applies to our lives in real ways. But first I want to pause because what we saw in this text is we saw Jesus pause. And I don't want to brush over what Jesus himself refused to brush over because amidst his rising popularity, amidst his most successful day of ministry, amidst a new buzz, amidst people slammed at his door, it says Jesus rose early in the morning, went to a desolate place, and prayed. See that? Jesus prayed. And he, he didn't just pray on his way to class. He didn't just pray before his meal. He didn't just pray when he was blanking on a math test. He carved time out of his day before the sun rose and Jesus Christ, God in flesh, withdrew to have fellowship with his Father. So you believers in this room, do you see the weight of what's happening here? Do you see the importance of this? Because in, in Christian circles, the word communion has, has almost lost its, been robbed of its meaning as a verb, and we see it only as a noun now. We do communion in church. Communion is something that happens when we take the, the, the blood and the bread and we eat it. But there is no better verb for what Jesus is doing here than communing with God. Jesus is going into a real, impactful act of community with God the Father. And if Jesus, who is the Son of God, who is God himself, recognizes the need to spend quality fellowship with God, how much more should we realize that need? How much more should we desire that? And we shouldn't do this in a manner of legalism. Right? I joked with Jordan today about going to church. And it's not, so we, Jesus doesn't want you to be a legalist. He doesn't want you to sit down and be like, man, I need to get in my Bible today uh, because I need to, because I have to. But Jesus wants us to be driven to God out of desperation. Not out of legality, but out of desire. And here we see Jesus Christ, the perfect spot, spotless lamb, crying out to God and going and spending fellowship with him. And that's because Jesus knew he could not accomplish what he had set out to do without the ministry of God. 
without God ministering to him, without him having a relationship with God. And if Jesus can't do that, you can't do that either. You cannot be the Christian that Jesus has purchased you to be if you try to do it without fellowship with God. It is for your joy. It is for your benefit. It is for your comfort. It is for your encouragement. It is for your good. Seek God. In the personal, quiet time of your life, seek to do it. Trust God's word. And see, this is big for me. Because not only have I reached the stage where Owen can sit down and watch TV, I reached the stage where the parent is always complaining about when the, the kid wakes up. <laughs> and I'm at that stage now. Owen will, will not sleep in past seven. And what's that, what that has done to me and my wife is it's made us wake up with Owen, where we used to have time to, to get in the Word. We used to have time to kind of decompress and spend some time in prayer before Owen woke up. That's now gone away. <laughs> And now, in order to do that, we have to wake up earlier. But we haven't yet. <laughs> but see, here's the thing. Is my, the reason I'm not getting up earlier has less to do with my level of exhaustion and it has more to do with my view of God. You see, what that's saying is that my God is too small. My God is not worth it. My God doesn't drive me to desire that. I can handle it on my own. Maybe if I have time, maybe if I'm feeling good enough, then I'll get up. But if I really see the reality of who God is, shouldn't that drive me to seek God in a desolate place? Shouldn't that drive me to have communion with God? And you see, we all have a desire to be heard. We hear that in crises, where the person who's, who's going through something desires to be heard. In prayer, we have a, the God of the universe who desires for us to cry out to him, who desires to be near to us. Psalm 77, verse 1, the psalmist cries out. He says, I cry out aloud to God, aloud to God, and he hears me. If you think a better source of encouragement or energy is your friends or your sleep or your hobbies, your God's too small. Your God's not the God of the Bible because the God of the Bible holds every good and perfect gift. In Matthew eleven twenty-eight, 28, Jesus cries out, he says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Believers, if, if it was good for Jesus to seek the fellowship of God, it will be overwhelmingly good for us. So do it. Do it and encounter the real promises of God. And so Jesus goes, as he did before, um, the temptation we saw a couple weeks ago, he went and prayed. And so he goes and prays and encounters God in a desolate place. And then here comes Peter. Right? We'll hear that phrase a lot, and it never is followed by a great story about Peter. Here comes Peter, and they're all searching for him, and he's like, Jesus, what are you doing out here? This is a desolate place. He says, everyone is seeking you. Come back. Come back and do your healings. Now, why is it these people are seeking Jesus? It's because they want to be healed. That's what they've seen. Why wouldn't we want that? That's a natural response they are not seeking Jesus to worship Jesus. They're not seeking Jesus to know Jesus. They're seeking Jesus to be healed and amused by Jesus. And Jesus sees that. And he sees that heart. And look at what he says, verses 38 and 39. And he said to them, Let us go on to the next towns, that I may preach there also. For that is why I came out. And he went through all of Galilee, preaching in the synagogues, and casting out demons. You see, Jesus came to heal, but his healing is penultimate. It's next to Jesus' desire for preaching. He came to preach. And why is that more important? Because the world needed his message. What was Jesus' message? We saw this a couple weeks ago. Mark 1.15, Jesus said, The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. You see, Jesus' message is turn from your sins because the kingdom of God is at hand. Jesus came to preach a coming kingdom. He came to preach repentance from sins. He came to preach forgiveness. And Peter doesn't see the value of that yet. He says, Jesus, come and heal. The people, they're still at your door. There are crowds. But Jesus says, let us go from here. Leave these people, for I have come to preach. But look at what Peter's confession was. 
later in the narrative as recorded in the Gospel of John. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and come to know that you are the Holy One of God. You see, this scene is, is set up by Jesus asking, do you, do you, who do you think I am? And Peter, Peter here says, he says, you're God. And what does Peter appeal to? Does he appeal to the miracles? Does he appeal to the crowds? No, he appeals to the words of Jesus. And he says, by your words, we have come to know who you are. You see, it's in the message of Jesus that we find salvation. It's in the message of repentance and belief that we are saved. You see, Jesus knew that his healings were child's play, right? These were the fireworks of Gandalf. He knew they were amazing. He knew that people would love them. But the world didn't need another healer. The world needed a savior. So rather than being treasured as a trinket, Jesus chose to continue his path to the cross to die as a savior. And we, humanity, need words of Christ more than we need the works of Christ. We need the words of salvation. And so you, when you see Jesus, what do you see? Do you see in Jesus his message of the gospel? Do you see his cry to repent and believe in the Son of God who came and died for your sins and rose again so that we may have life for him? Do you see repentance and salvation through Christ or do you see just a figure or a moral teacher or, or a, good, a good guy? You see, Jesus' healings don't save, but they do point to a kingdom where there's no sin, and there's no sickness, and there's no disease. The healings have meaning. This, this dude comes from a place where these things don't exist. This dude has power over the things of this world that we hate, but it's Jesus' teaching, his message, message, and his cross that save. We should cling to those. That should be the object of greatest importance to us. So what do you see when you see Jesus? Do you see that message? Do you see that purpose? This, Jesus is telling us, this is why I came. For this purpose I have come to preach. Jesus came to preach the gospel of salvation. And that purpose shapes everything Jesus does here on earth. And in closing, I want to look at the third story here. Mark 1, 40 through 45. And a leper came to him, imploring him, Kneeling, said to him, If you will, you can make me clean. Moved with pity, he stretched out his hand and touched him. He said to him, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him, and he was made clean. And Jesus sternly charged him and sent him away at once. He said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go, show yourselves to the priests, and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded for a proof to them. But he went out and began talking about it freely. And the news spread so that Jesus could no longer openly enter a town, but was out in the desolate place. And the people were coming to him from every quarter. And so here we see a man with leprosy. Um, and, and leprosy, uh, some people have heard about leprosy, some people haven't. It was, it was a death sentence. And, and, and what would happen is your skin would slough off and you'd get festers and you'd get boils and it was extremely painful physically, but there was also a, a relational condemnation that came with leprosy. Because the thing about leprosy is it was extremely contagious. And so laws were written, laws were recorded in the Bible, okay, not just in, in like the, the writings of the day. God, in the law, gave rules for how you would treat lepers because God was protecting his people from diseases, that's one thing I always remember reading through Leviticus and you read these things and God's giving like laws for purification. Um, like, hey, don't touch a person if they're doing this. Don't be by a person if they're sick with this. And I remember reading through that and being like, why is this in the Bible? But if you think about it, how merciful of God. We're in a pre-scientific age. God is telling his people how to avoid disease. That's pretty cool. If you think about it, God, before any scientist knows what these diseases are, is graciously and mercifully preserving his people's life by telling them how to remove themselves from these illnesses. And these lepers are part of that. 
You lived on the outside of town. You couldn't talk to people. You couldn't touch people. You couldn't be around people unless they were lepers like you. Really, it it was, and this sounds humorous, but it was the equivalent of an Old Testament zombie movie. What happens when your friend becomes a zombie in the movie? You kill them. Why? Because they're dangerous. That was what the lepers were. I remember um, when we were in Hawaii, is it, is it Molokini or Molokai, one of the moles? Um, it was a leper colony. And I remember even hearing that in, like, uh, in the modern age, it was like kind of creepy. And there's stories of these um, Catholic priests who came and ministered to the lepers, and it's still kind of, it's like, this is real. Leprosy was still an issue even when Hawaii um, was just brought into the United States. But did you see what happened here? Okay, now, now paint for yourself this scene. Okay, here we have Jesus. And what's Jesus' popularity level right now? He's like King Kong, okay? People lined up at his door wanting to see him, wanting to hear him, wanting to be healed by him. He is, is numero uno right now in this area. And so here we have Jesus walking down a street and then the diseased runs through the crowd. I mean, you see how celebrities kind of walk with a posse around them? They don't want the common folk to just come up and shake their hands, right? They'll sign a few autographs, but then when they have to go somewhere, they're like, hey guys, no more people, let's roll. And here is Jesus, and he's walking, and death on legs comes sprinting to him. Now on one hand, these people are horrified, and they're like, we need to stop this. But on the other hand, they're not touching that person. They don't want that disease. And in horror, this diseased, outcast, condemned creature falls down before Jesus, skin rotting off, smells like death, dressed like a beggar, falls before Jesus saying, if you will, you can make me clean. You see, the interesting thing here is the leper never questioned Jesus' ability. The leper knew Jesus had the power to clean him. What he didn't know is would Jesus be willing? Would Jesus be willing to touch this outcast, this person left to die, this person who is beyond redemption, would Jesus heal him? And you can imagine as this happens, this man has sprinted in, it's caught everybody by guard, you could hear a pin drop. How would Jesus respond to this man? And Jesus reached out and he touched him. Probably the first human touch this man has received in years. And what does Jesus say? I will. I will heal you. Be clean. Can you imagine that? And imagine what's going on because in the script, like leprosy, like skin falling off of your body, it says the leprosy left him. Like, what happened to that person's body? I can't even imagine what happened before. And he rose up, and the leprosy left him, and he was made clean. Now, at this point, I mean, we're only 50 verses into Mark. Should we really be amazed that Jesus healed this person? It should be of no surprise to us that God does God things. The creator has creative power. God healed somebody. He made them. He sustains them. Big whoop. We've seen Jesus heal. But what's the important part of this? What should surprise us is not that Jesus healed. What should surprise us is why Jesus healed. Look at what Jesus says, or look at what Mark says here. Mark 1.41, moved with pity. He stretched out his hand and touched him and said, I will be clean. Do you hear that? Moved with pity. You see, unlike the gods of Greek or Roman mythology, our God doesn't rule his people via fear. He doesn't threaten them with ominous signs and say, unless you please me, you will all die. Our God intervened, became flesh, and then went into humanity's disease out of pity. 
out of pity. And it's not that Jesus was up in heaven and he saw our inner beauty and our hidden worth behind this rotted, disgusting flesh. There was no hidden beauty. This man was dying. This man was diseased. This man was cursed. This man was a danger. And yet Jesus saw his wretchedness. And in it, he compassionately healed him. God had mercy on him through his son. What a beautiful portrait of redemption. You see, this is purpose number three. Jesus cleanses. You see, did you see what happened? Look back at verses 43 through 44. And Jesus sternly charged him and sent him away at once. And Jesus said to him, see that you say nothing to anyone, but go, show yourself to the priest and offer for your, for your cleansing what Moses commanded for a proof to them. You see, with healings, Jesus healed, right? We just saw someone with fever be healed. We'll see lame people walk. We'll see blind people see. But with this disease, it's not simply healed. This person was made clean. Now, it's interesting. If you spend time and you look at the texture and you see the healing, we see healed, 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 healed. But in this text, we see clean, 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 cleansed. You see, this was different. And that's because for leprosy, according to the law, a law given by God himself, these people had to prove that they were restored. These people had to prove that they had been cleaned. And there were all these things they had to do and these timetables and these sacrifices. And as they go and as they get better, the sacrifices get bigger and bigger and bigger. And it culminates with a sacrifice. And Jesus not only healed him in a word, he cleansed him. Do you realize that? Who has the power to declare somebody clean? The priest does. That's who it is. The priest gets the final say if this person is clean. And Jesus says, go to the priest, you're clean. Why? Because Jesus is the great priest. Jesus is the one who has come to give cleanliness to us all. And why is this miracle distinct from the other healings? Because it's symbolic of our own spiritual disease. We were outcast. We were kicked out. We were ostracized. We were rotten. We are dead in our transgressions and sins. But we see Christ's compassion. Those of you who were in Bible study two weeks ago, we saw this passage in Romans 8, verses 1 through 4. There, and, and have that leprosy story in mind as we read this. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by flesh, could not do by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. You see, through Jesus, this leper was made right before the law. And through Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, we who were dead in our trespasses received the full righteous requirement of the law through the person and work of Jesus Christ. This story with the leper, this is your story. Because this is who Jesus is. This is his message. Repent, believe, and be cleansed by the spotless Lamb of God. And in closing, one final point. Verses 43 through 45. And Jesus sternly charged him and sent him away at once. And he said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go, show yourself to the priest, and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded for a proof to them. But he went out and began to talk about it freely and to, the, and to spread the news so Jesus could no longer openly enter a town but was in the desolate place and the people were coming to him from every quarter. And so here we see the popularity of Jesus growing and growing and growing and now he cannot even enter a town because the people hear about him and crowd him so much so that it's impossible but that's odd that Jesus says, don't, don't tell anyone. And not only is it odd, but it's cool to see the response. The guy's like, I can't not tell people. It gets out. 
Jesus' redemption gets out. But why would Jesus say this? And there's a lot of debate over this point, but I think it's for two reasons. The first reason is, I don't think pe- people didn't yet know Jesus for who he was. You see, they didn't see him rightly yet. In fact, in Mark's gospel, there's not really a clear statement about who Jesus is from the crowd until the centurion on the cross says, surely this man is the son of God. And that's because what Mark wants us to see is the clearest picture of Jesus Christ is not Jesus the healer or Jesus the preacher. It's Jesus Christ on the cross. That's the clearest picture we have of Jesus. And in light of this lack of knowledge, Jesus didn't want people to know who he was for the second reason, His time had not yet come. His time had not yet come. You see, Jesus knew this newfound excitement over him was passing. He knew it was a fad for obvious reasons, right? Jesus knew he came to die. He knew he came to die. And here we have everybody wanting not for him to die, for him to stay alive. Why? People love healers. This is a guy we can all get along with. This is a guy we want to invite over to our party. We want him at grandma's birthday, We love healers. People don't have a problem for healers, but Jesus wouldn't be tracked down and killed for being a healer. He would be tracked down and murdered for claiming to be God himself. You see, this healer came so that he would die to be our savior. And through his message, our wounds of sin are cleansed. Do you see that picture of Jesus? Do you see the purpose of a loving God intervening with a ruined creation to restore it? Do you seek that God? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you. We thank you that you will. Lord, we thank you that you are not scared off by the disease of society but you enter into it for the purpose of restoring us. Lord, we thank you that you came to preach and we pray that your message of the gospel is heard in here today, Lord, because the message of the gospel is ultimate over healing. Those who are healed still died, but those who believe in the gospel will never die. And so, Lord, make your message clear through your word. Make your power clear through the gospel of Mark. And Lord, force us to respond and be drawn to you and run to a willing and saving Savior. We pray this in your name. Amen.